Good evening, everyone. I thought I would start the show this week with a, a little trailer uh, for our Festival of Economics taking place in Dundee in less than two weeks. Uh, that was instead of our normal introduction. Thanks very much for joining us. We seem to have, be having a little bit of problem with Facebook. So we've just got viewers from Twitter and YouTube at the moment. I'll see what I can do about that because it's always good to hear from those watching the show on Facebook. Well, tonight we are going to talk with James Plunkett and we're going to cover some of the issues in his book and we're also going to talk about inequality and he's written some fantastic pieces on inequality so we've got a great interview with James coming up 68 episode 68 of Scottonomics so thanks so much if you're stuck if you've stick, stuck with us right from the start um, and hello and welcome to you if you're watching us for the first time uh, and someone contacted me and said can we have a little look at that picture that's often behind you because we can't quite see what it is and um, so I'm going to do that right now. So it's a uh, old map of London um, uh, and I think it was in um, Jane Austen's London. My partner and I and my partner's from Essex and we met in London that's why we've got that in our flat in Dundee. So for the two people who've asked me over the last few weeks what that is, that's what it is. Anyway, on to the topic for tonight. So James has written a fantastic book, which is um, called End State, and it's looking at how we fix our broken state. Um, you're really going to enjoy this interview tonight. It's about 48 minutes long. Uh, we've, of course, got an extended version on our Patreon. We actually asked James what he thought around the just transition and the growth and uh, other elements of that kind of the importance of growth to an economy and that's available on our patreon we cut, cut that out just a, a little, to make tonight's episode a little bit shorter and um, please do say hello throughout the show and give us your um, comments and um, it's always really interesting to see i hope you enjoy this james an uh, incredibly intelligent guy a lot of really really good ideas and certainly uh, a few ideas for us to look at the way that we run our economy very differently. I hope you enjoy the show and look forward to hearing from you as it progresses. James Plunkett, welcome to Scottonomics. Thank you so much for doing this interview for us today. Um, I just want to dive straight into a first question because I've really enjoyed reading your book, End State. Now, um, there's one big question in the book, and it is, does our economy, as it currently governed, enable most people to live their life to the full? Now, I'd like the audience to think about that as we talk through the, the topics we're going to cover today, because I think the framing's perfect, because isn't that what we all want? And shouldn't that be the bare minimum, an economy that works for us all? So if the economy isn't delivering this bare minimum, can you give us your overview of the areas that you think are broken? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a big question, I think, and it's the one my book um, explores. I think the, the, the big the big story I'm telling, I suppose, in the book is this sense that the state has, well, the way in which we govern society has, has fallen behind and has, has failed to keep up with the way in which the world's changing. And I look, I suppose, through the lens of technology and the way in which technology is transforming our economy and our society, but you could look through other other lenses and it's really about this sense that the world has changed profoundly in the last 20 30 years and we haven't seen equivalent changes in the way in which we govern our our society and economy so i look through different i guess elements of the way in which the state works so you know one example would be um social security and the kind of the way in which we give workers security um in their lives it's pretty clear that the kind of jobs people do have changed profoundly that many people are now not employed in the traditional way we might have expected the rise of the gig economy the rise of new forms of contract um zero hours contract for example and those new forms of work really do not dovetail with the way in which the welfare system is designed so you know you find if you're an uber driver trying to claim universal credit the system just wasn't designed for that kind of form of work right it was designed for waged employment in which someone might fall sick for a period of months and would claim support and then move back into work so it's designed for a model of work that is you know is 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 100 years old or more and that's just one example really i look i look at other if you like sort of pillars of the state so another example would be economic regulation the way that we regulate markets again was designed for a pre-digital world it doesn't work for the likes of facebook and google and the the new sort of pervasive manipulation we see of 
decision making by consumers online. It, it can't cope with these big monopolies of big tech and competition authorities are struggling. So, so you just see, I think, across the piece when you look at those areas, when you look at healthcare and the way in which today's healthcare problems are so different from the kind of problems the healthcare system was designed to solve decades ago, that we've we've fallen behind. And I, I talk about this gap, the governance gap, if you like, opening up. And I think across the piece, there's a sort of upgrading to be done um, where the question I ask really is, you know, if you built the state from scratch today, what would you build? And, and I think you'd build something really quite different from the state we've inherited from the 20th century. You, that's 20, 30 years when you've said there that things are very different from, from, from where we were in, let's say, the you know, 80s or the 90s. But actually in the book, you compare and you start with your comparison from about 150 years ago and you compare the challenges we face now as we move to like a digitalised version of capitalism. Um, and you compare that to the birth of industrial capitalism. Can you outline the similarities and the social ills that you can see between those two very different times in history? Uh, so I, I've always liked this phrase, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And I think that holds in this comparison of the dig digital revolution and the industrial revolution. I remember when I was um, starting out on the on the path of writing my book and it, you know, it didn't it didn't set out to be an optimistic book. Um, I set out to write about the big problems we face, but then I, I had this moment when I was researching where I, I went into a um, one of those lovely secondhand bookshops on the Charing Cross Road in in London, and I stumbled on this book, which was um, a collection of newspaper articles and letters um, and diary entries from the time of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it was from about the years 1840 to 1870. Um, and I sat I sat in this bookshop and I started reading this book. And the thing that um, made the hair sort of stand up on the back of my neck was this sense of similarity, that, that when you looked at the kind of sense of crisis and this sort of sense that things were spinning out of control that developed in that, that, that mid 19th century period, when you know, the economy was being changed profoundly by technology. In that case, it was industrialization, the rise of factory employment, urbanization, um, the problems that flowed from that, like not least sewage in the big cities, for example, was the kind of big problem of the time. And there was this sense, and you see this you know, in, in, in newspaper articles and in letters people wrote to the newspapers at the time, that people were feeling their government had lost its grip um, and that government was kind of proving incapable of governing this new economy that was emerging. Um, and the, the, the funny thing is the reason that left me actually feeling quite hopeful is that what we did in response to industrialization in the end was we, we, re, we built a new kind of state. You know, we built a whole new architecture that was capable of governing an industrial economy. And so, you know, we did things like lay public sewage systems to cope with, uh, you know, the kind of challenges of urbanization. And um, we built vast amounts of housing uh, we established eventually the NHS to deal with the kind of health challenges of a, of a modern economy. We established social security to help people in those jobs to be secure as they move through their lives. We did things like ban child labor um, from factories. And so actually when you zoom out enough, you get this story of the world changes as a result of technology and then we adapted the state in response. And I started to think you know, really that is what we now need to do in response to the di di digital revolution is have a similarly profound process of adapting the state so it's capable of governing this new kind of economy. And, you know, I think we've done it before, if you like, and we can do it again, although it will take, it's a process of decades, not not years. And that might be the difference that the things that you listed wasn't a few years or even a couple of decades. It was a much longer period of time. And I think the techno technological change didn't change so rapidly that the state was able to, um, catch up or stay, you know, stay only a few months or years behind. Whereas the the level of technological progress now, it's much harder for the state to kind of stay just behind the technological progress. And I'm thinking about, you know, automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence. These things seems to change so rapidly that that speed of response from the state has surely got to be much faster than it was, you know, 150 years ago. I think that's right. Yeah, and I think one of the worries, particularly on problems like climate change, you know, where you reach tipping points and you get to the point where it's too late and however fast you catch up, it's it's just too late because certain dynamics have kicked in. So I, I do think that point about um, 
we've got to be far more um, agile, if you want to use that word in, in the way we respond. I, I would say, though, if you look back at um, the Industrial Revolution, it, it's, it's striking how long it took us to get to grips with what we now think of as kind of, you know, obvious, obvious responses to these problems. So one of the um, stories I like the best from that period is, is this um, a situation that became known as the Gage Wars, where when we first laid the railway tracks across Britain, they were laid at these two different gauges. And so because there was no standardised gauge for rail railway tracks, we ended up with essentially two different railway networks that couldn't connect. And so wherever, wherever a train sort of had to pass between these railway networks, you had to get off one train for a wide gauge and get onto another train for a narrow gauge. And that problem, although it now seems to us obvious, of course, there should be a single gauge for railway tracks. Of course, we should have standardized approaches to those kinds of physical infrastructure. The gauge wars, as they called them at the time, ran on for about 60 years. Um, and you know, only then did we get to this kind of very obvious solution that you should have economic regulation and you should standardize railway tracks in that example. So I do think we've got a track record of taking quite a long time to put in place what seem in hindsight obvious solutions. And I suspect we might see some of that play out this time as well. You've identified some of the issues there. And I think that, you know, if you're talking about similar issues, lack of housing, uh, real uh, issues with the environment from, from the industrial age to where we are now, also a welfare and a benefit, benefit system that doesn't quite cope. If those are three or four of the areas, how do we start to, fix those problems yeah i mean the, the million dollar question i think it's um it's it's really interesting how much we see more throughout history how much we've relied on crises and it, it's quite um i guess a bit one of the sobering notes that comes out from the book is if you do look at these problems we encountered in the 19th century for example the you know, problems tended to get pretty bad before we got our act together if you like so you know the, the sewage on the banks of the thames for example that built up until we had an adequate um, public sewage system was was six feet to two meters deep um, before we before we acted. Um, and, the, and the only reason in that case that MPs got their act together was that Parliament happens to be on the banks of the Thames and it and it smelt pretty bad in Parliament by that point. And so Disraeli eventually helped to steer through a bill to to build the public in, the, the embankments in London and a, and a proper sewage system. So. Um, you know, the sewage gets pretty deep, if you like, before we act. And often there's this kind of dynamic, I guess, that plays out that I, I sometimes refer to as a mudslide dynamic where you know, social problems build up. It becomes more and more obvious that there's, there's this sort of accumulation of problems. Um, and then at some point there's a rainstorm in the form of some kind of crisis that triggers the mudslide of change. Um, and suddenly, often when that happens, you see, as we did in the post-war decades in, in Britain, a, a very quick, sudden amount of change and actually change can be suddenly very quick having having not happened for many decades so there's this sort of dynamic of not enough change and then suddenly lots coming at once that happens in in politics which is is messy is frustrating and creates this sort of real volatility i think um but i mean one of the the really interesting questions is sort of you know wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to wait for a crisis um and how do we try to make our, our systems of governance and um, our systems of the state less less dependent on crises um, to reform themselves. And I do think it, it kind of, I closed the book with a chapter on sort of change and the way government functions and I, that, you know, getting into things like, what does it look like to have a more agile state to try to test as we go, to try to iterate policy, to try to experiment more and try out radically new things and then scale them up if they're working. And that's quite a different mindset to bring to what is still, I think, quite a sort of waterfall old fashioned approach to public policy that we have today. But there's a lot of those new ways of working, I think, that are, that are, in, that are sort of central to the, to, the, to the response to this challenge. The, the other point I wanted to make was thinking about your when you were reading that book or those series of letters in the bookshop um, and you're looking ahead and saying, wow, these problems were the same. Um, last year I read The Ragged Trouser, Ragged Trouser Philanthropist and you know I think that was written in the late 19th century and that could have been written three weeks ago, you know, with just names and, and the occupations changing, but the problems were all very similar. And I read a book last year called The Street by Anne Petrie, which is a fantastic book set, set in, in the States. And again, that could have been written three weeks ago. So when you're saying that we've kind of solved these problems before, I, could, I would come back and say, well, actually, the problems are still there. 
they've just there's just a nuance and they're slightly different but we haven't really mm. solved those problems of lack of housing huge amounts of inequality poor jobs uh, and poor working conditions and poor living conditions from that 150 years to, to to where we are now would you accept that or i i think i'm um what would i call what would i say I'm, I'm i suppose i'm an optimist in some senses on this and you know if you look over a I'd say 150 year period to 1870, um, you know, life expectancy, for example, has doubled and in some cases trebled across the whole of Britain, I mean, pretty much. And, and actually across much of the developed world, in, in fact, most of the world has seen huge leaps, um, a doubling or even a trebling in life expectancy. And that is because, you know, we got a handle on what was the big killer of the time, which was communicable disease um, and we did that by building public health systems um, and by spreading an understanding of sanitation clean water um, healthcare systems that were able to prescribe medicines antibiotics and so on and so I, I think healthcare is a good example of how it's not quite the same problem that we face now you know take take your point on certain issues where we failed to make progress but if you take healthcare the the, the really sizable burden of disease as people sometimes call it um, today is around mental health, is around chronic conditions that affect people throughout their lives in fluctuating ways. And it is not, you know, diphtheria and typhoid and the kind of communicable disease that, that we built systems to respond to 150 or 100 years ago. And so, you know, it's a really good example because in healthcare, for example, you know, how, what kind of systems do you need to help people with mental health or with chronic conditions? It's very different, actually, from the kind of you know, prescribe a pill or prescribe an operation systems that we built to tackle those earlier physical, more acute physical communicable conditions. Mm -hmm. And so you need to certainly not slide backwards, I think, on some of those earlier challenges as we've seen with COVID, you know, clearly those communicable disease can still be a major threat to our well-being. But we need to build new systems that are more capable in that case of helping people manage chronic conditions, manage their, manage their mental health, manage their well-being in the round and the lifestyle factors. And I think that kind of that point that in so many cases, the problem has changed, the kind of character of the problem has changed and the, the character of the policy response need, needs to change in response. The character of the response is one thing, but also the makeup and the design of the institutions is crucially important as well. What's your thoughts on that? institutional development of the state and of the main institutions of this we are living in a very different world do we have the institutional set up to cope with that i i think it's emerging i think this kind of i keep having the sense of kind of the future state if you like for want of a better phrase so let's say this what, what will the government look like in 2050 i i think we can't quite see it yet but we can there's something kind of emerging from the fog if that if that makes sense and i think it's not that different to the world in let's say the early 20th century when you know a whole, a whole range of reformers at that time were starting to think through what might what kind of state might we need to respond to the challenges of that moment and we ended up with what we came to call social democracy the social democratic settlement the post-war settlement if you'd ask someone to predict what that kind of mid 20th century state would look like in say 1910 they would have got some things right they would have got a lot wrong and I suspect we're at a similar place of, you know, what kind of institutions do we need? What kind of state do we need in, say, 30 years time? Um, I mean, I think I think some things that are emerging and are becoming clearer is that it, it seems to me it needs to be a, um, a less technocratic state, if that makes sense. I, I do think there's something quite um, common to a lot of the systems that we built in the sort of mid, early to mid 20th century. They were these you know, that they were the classic sort of big bureaucracy, they were hierarchical, hierarchical Whitehall departments is the sort of emblematic example. The NHS itself is a, is a big bureaucratic hierarchy, sort of almost Fordist in the way it functions. The welfare system we've built is ever more technocratic. It's very complicated to deal with. It has all these rules and criteria that mean that when you interact with it, it's confusing. It doesn't feel particularly... Um, empowering, it leaves you feeling not very good about yourself, it leaves you feeling um, sort of done to rather than done with. And I think, you know, when people try to describe this future type of government, they tend to describe something that's, I suppose, sort of more human, simpler, kind of warmer. Some people use the word relational to describe this future state, that it's, 
it cares more about um, how people feel. It cares more about the quality of human relationships. It cares more about communities and well-being in the round and not just about sort of illness. It cares about well-being as opposed to just illness. And I think that that's kind of, that's pretty impressionistic because as I say, this thing is still still emerging, I think. But I think you're starting to see... It's an easy picture, that, isn't it's it? It's an easy picture. It's an easy picture as it would have been sort of in the 20th century, but it's starting to emerge. And I think, you know, the key thing is we need to build it. It's not just going to emerge if we sit and wait. So we have to sort of lean into that, try and work out what it looks like and build it together. And can you think of any examples where, where that's happening already? I mean, I'm thinking of the community wealth building movement, you know, and the, the, I think it's the, the Preston model and there's some you know, anchor institutions and, you know, there are some kind of um, green shoots for a slightly different way to, to run our economy and our society. Can you think of any other examples? I think something that's fascinating at this moment in politics is on the one hand, there's this sort of gloomy sense that politics is broken. And if you look, certainly if you look at the sort of, I don't know, the, the upper echelons of our of our political realm don't feel like they're working particularly well. There, there's sort of dead wood, right? There's kind of seems like a lack of ideas, a lack of boldness, a lack of vision. But if you look at the edges of the system, if you like the periphery of the system, so kind of local services, local um, community run projects, the frontier of academic research, there's this almost a renaissance of new ideas and new approaches. And you name some examples there. I think I would name the kind of experiments in relational public services where people build community-based healthcare, community-based mental health services, amazing results from some of these kind of approaches where you, where you help people in groups rather than individually to help to manage a chronic condition or to, to um, group counseling approaches, for example incredibly effective and I think a lot of these um, new ideas are happening at the front line if you like and there's a funny thing about our system that it's sort of died from the from the center out um, and actually there's a, there's a lot of life there's almost kind of new buds growing around the edges um, in some of these local experiments and as you say lots of them are very place-based I think is is really fascinating that a lot of these experiments are about saying what if you look through place as the lens and say what would it look like to have a more joined up approach to the services in this local area, as opposed to the sort of the old approach, which is sort of the Whitehall silo centralized department. So there's just, there's just a big question for me about how do you sort of almost absorb some of that energy and centralize some of the, bring, bring some of that energy into the system from the edges, as opposed to trying to sort of push out ideas from this kind of, you know, pretty old, pretty old fashioned centre. Yeah, I, I remember when I was studying politics at university, the, and I was studying the European, the European community as it was at that point. And the, the, the main kind of rationale for the European community was that this idea of subsidiarity and that Europe would only take on power where it was most relevant and, and so should the state. And, you know, through the, the, this century, I haven't seen this idea of it's this idea of subsidiarity seems to have disappeared. It certainly disappeared in the UK, where we have a very centralised state in Westminster. In Scotland, we have, I would suggest, even a more centralised state. And this idea of making decisions at the closest level to, to the people who are impacted by those decisions seems to have disappeared. Have you seen any kind of renaissance in this idea of subsidiarity and I think I think we need that because I think there's something very interesting. The word devolution, you know, does there's there's a bit of renewed interest in the question of devolution in all its different contexts. I, I do think there's a funny thing that's happened with devolution in the last sort of decade or so, where um, you know if you get devolution wrong, it becomes a sort of um, uh, almost like a dismantling, right? It becomes a kind of the thing that you the thing that we've been does devolving it seems to me in the last 10 years is sort of we devolve problems rather than power right there's this sort of sense of let's pass the buck down to local authorities for example um let's devolve these problems but not really to devolve the power to address them and i think that there's, there's, there is a real value i think in and it would be very timely to have a have a new conversation about devolution that is more in that space of sub subsidiarity because you know, it seems to me that there are some things that are too decentralized. So, you know, I would point to the example of the way in which we use technology, you know, um, across um, the UK, the number of different local, for example, planning systems there are, there is this enormous duplication in the sort of underlying technologies that we use to govern. Um, 
And that seems to me just a case of duplication and mess and fragmentation when you could build shared systems on which to do things like you know planning, community engagement, identity verification, and so on. So there's there's cases where we want we want to centralize, I think, and share more, share more platforms. Um, and then there's cases as more as you describe where you do want to push the actual what matters, which is decision making and power and autonomy, down to communities. So it's it's quite a complex picture. And I think we need to kind of refresh our view of what devolution really means for the way in which the world now now works. And I think if we do that, that can be a real unlocking force. It can unlock a lot of that energy that's in communities. But if you get it wrong, it becomes a kind of, you know, fragmentation, a duplication and a sort of um, dismantling, which is where I think more we've been for the last 10 years or so. That that leads nicely into um, the idea of the United Kingdom as the state. Um, do you think the UK is a failed state? I think we have, um, I don't know if I did quite as far as to call the UK a failed state, but I do think it's what might you call it, an outdated state, or it's um, it's a state or a settlement, if you like, that functioned, you know, I, I think, you know, pretty well for us for a number of decades in that, particularly that kind of late 20th century period, and proved capable of making great progress, I think, on a number of really significant challenges. You know, certainly, again, if you zoom out, to a 100, 150 year time frame, that's when you start to see, you know, we have made meaningful, sustained and sustainable progress on some profound social challenges around, around healthcare, around protecting consumers, around the way in which we regulate markets, around, around even around the way in which we give people security through their working lives. Um, the question for me is, you know, has, has, that, has that model, has that settlement run its course and do we now need a new one? And I personally think, that's what we're starting to run into as we get deeper into the 21st century is, you know, a settlement that worked pretty well for us for a number of decades has sort of run its natural life and, and we now need something something new. And I think in the context of devolution, I think I think that word subsidiarity is is a good one, albeit so it's like a sort of technical term that this, this question of at what level of the system should you make decisions? Um, and as I say, uh, for me, it's not that it's not just about purely a sort of um, decentralization agenda, because for me, some things now should be more central than they were before, not least technical standards, sharing of data, for example, sharing of technology infrastructure. But within that, you do want to have a have a model in which you have autonomy, right? And you, you devolve decision-making closer to the people that decisions affect. And that, I think that feels, you know, we said earlier, you know, how do you describe the future state? I think one thing we can say with quite a lot of confidence is that the state in 2050 will be a, a more decentralized state that gives people more autonomy um, than the state as than the state as we know it today. You, you're talking about looking to 2050. If we look back and there had been a different state, one of the easiest things to do is look back 30 years. So going back to 1990, um, 1995, is the state and is the government that different from 95 to, to to where we are now 30 years later I, I think one of the most um telling one of the most telling things is how similar our settlement is now to 30 years ago and if you think i mean when you step back and think how profoundly the world has changed particularly as a result of technology in that period and um, but really when we look through our systems of course there's been you know incremental changes and of course we've moved money around and certain aspects of the state have shifted. Certainly, for example, the proportion of public money we spend on healthcare has risen. Um, new challenges have, have emerged around aging, for example, and social care and so on. But really when it comes down to the sort of, um, if you like the how rather than the what, so the kind of, how does the state function? How do we do policy making? Um, how does Whitehall operate? How do we design policies and implement them? I mean, really, a lot of those methodologies have been pretty consistent, not not just back to the mid '90s, but even decades before that. And I think you know, it's no, it's not a surprise that when you look at the kind of frontier of the, if you like, the commercial sector, the private sector, you know, the, the companies that have been founded in the last ten years are unrecognisable from the way in which companies used to function. You know, the, the way that Uber operates, the way in which Google, Google operates, the culture at a company like Spotify. Um, are completely unrecognisable from the traditional corporation or the way companies functioned in the early 90s. So that's not to say we should emulate all of that, because there's much that we know is 
is problematic about those cultures, but you know, not to learn from the new practices and the new ways in which companies use technology seems to me like tying our hands behind our back, but, but behind our back. So, you know, I do think it troubles me that the states that look so similar to, if you like, before the internet emerged. Um, and it seems to me we're not going to get out of this pickle until the state looks pretty different and frankly probably looks quite a lot more like some of these frontier organizations that, that are able to use technology so much more effectively. Because that's exactly how I feel. I don't feel like there's much, you know, I used to, I worked in Westminster, I know you worked in um, Westminster number 10, I worked in at the parliament for, for a year and I know if I went back there 25 years later, it, it looks exactly the same. The structure is completely the same. So where does your optimism that, that I've got to say flows through your book, this optimism that things can and, and will change, where does this come from? Because, you know, just that one example, well, 30 years ago, we've hardly had any meaningful development. And I think we've got to be looking at a kind of paradigm shift, you know, not just this has changed a little bit or we've given a little bit more money to there. So tell me, because I need some right now, where does that optimism come from? Uh, uh, it really comes from zooming out. Um, and I think, yeah, as I say, when I when I set out to write my book, I wasn't intending to write an optimistic book, and it was, it was that um, when you zoom out and you look at the long term of social change, that's for me when you start to spot this mudslide dynamic, and you start to see that what happens repeatedly is this sense that kind of a need for change builds up and accumulates and becomes you know more and more self evident, and then there is this kind of unlocking, and it's as we said earlier, it's very hard to predict. You know what? What? Which rainstorm will it be that triggers the mudslide? Is really hard to predict, but everyone can see the mud that's that's mounted up on the hill on the hillside. And I, I think it's you know, it's quite hard to deny we're at a sort of moment that feels like that. It feels like this sense of sort of accumulated need for change, and it doesn't. You know that that can that can't stand if you like. That's that's what the dynamic tells us. The the other um, dynamic I think is gives me some hope is this repeated pattern that is fascinating in politics where new ideas emerge that everyone says are radical, unaffordable, unthinkable, and then they become common sense um, within within a matter of decades. And, you know, we see this throughout history with uh, free education, the NHS, the idea of social security, the idea of public housing, economic regulation, competition policy. I mean, you could just list the different elements of the modern state all of those were considered to be radical, unaffordable, dangerous acts of government overreach. You know, pu public sewage systems were called a dangerous act of government overreach when they were first mooted. Um, and then, of course, as soon as these things happen, people nod along as if we've always known they should happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and this is one of the premises for the book is what this tells us is that there, are, there will be ideas out there today that people currently think are unaffordable, radical, and the height of kind of radicalism um, that will in 20 years time be common sense. And it seems to me myopic to not think that's the case. And so the interesting question is not really will that happen because I think it's pretty clear that will happen. That dynamic is ongoing. It's kind of what are those ideas and is there anything we can do to, to speed up the process by which they become accepted as a new common sense. So that, that gives me a lot of hope. It's kind of the more you zoom out, the more hopeful you feel, I think. I noticed when you were saying about the arguments being used and, and you know that when um, we were trying to ban child labour, the same argument was made for when we were trying to introduce a minimum wage. You, know, you can just see those, it will impact the market and, and people will have to raise prices and there'll be a lot less jobs. You know, there was all of these kind of arguments being, being made. But yeah, as you said, it seems radical, but it just seems really normal now. And when I was reading it, I, I was kind of reminded of that Keynes quote that says, anything we can do, we can afford. What What is your thoughts on this idea that we can afford what we want? Because some of the ideas you've come up with in the book, the easy reaction is to say, well, who pays for that? Where does the money come from? Yeah, that, and there's another quote as well I, I love from Keynes that's about, um, you need to start with the ethics and then bring in the economics. Um, and you know he made that comment in a in a letter he wrote thinking about you know how should you how should you imagine in the future how should you think about long term social change and it's very interesting this concept that you know if you've started with the economics if you like you know was the NHS affordable you know, as it as it turned out to be in in the mid nineteen forties you know if you'd 
sat down and sort of costed the NHS, if you like, in the manner of an accountant and said, can we afford this? Do we have the spare money? You know, it's not clear the answer would have been yes, that that's not really how the public finances work. You know, it's not that you identify here is a here is an amount of spare money with which we will build the NHS. It's almost the other way around that you you flesh out this vision for where you're trying to get to and then you incrementally get there. Um, and that in itself unlocks some of the revenue streams, some of the growth and productivity impacts that then end up paying for the reforms. And so it, it, there's a very interesting dynamic that plays out, again, I've noticed in social change where often change comes from an argument about ethics as opposed to economics. And you know, again, this was very clearly the case with the ban on child labor. I say in the book, you know, we didn't, we didn't ban child labor on the basis of a cost benefit analysis. And arguably if you'd done the pure sort of treasury style cost benefit analysis at the time, maybe you wouldn't have banned child labor because you know industry was heavily dependent on child labor. But we said, this is the right thing to do. This is an ethical imperative. And we worked out how to do it. And the, eth the economics, if you like, flowed from there and the market adjusted. And of, and of course it did because it had to. And so there's this sense in which we come, we sometimes get this round the wrong way and we put the sort of economics before the ethics. Um, and I do think it's a, it's a good, yeah, it's a good kind of reminder from Keynes that we should, you start with the kind of society you want and believe to be ethically necessary and then work through the economics after that. And um, I think that's, yeah, it's something we often get wrong. I would just add a distinction there that we're not talking about the financing because what we're saying is we can finance anything. We're talking about the resources that are available. And I think the NHS is a perfect example. You know, when we created that, we looked at the we looked at the United Kingdom and we thought we can finance it because we're monetary sovereign, but we don't have the resources. We've got to go to the West Indies and bring in hundreds of thousands of of, of workers to support our national health service. If we want public transport, we've got to bring in more uh, resources to resource that. And that's where I think we just, um, when we're talking about economics, we too often get caught up in the money to pay for things and not the resources. And I think, again, I highlighted um, a section in your book where you said that um, uh, we, we, we need economists who can move beyond the orthodoxy to look at new ideas. And you mentioned um, behavioural economics and, you know, the book covers a lot of ideas and theories that, that are outside the orthodoxy and it challenges the orthodoxy, which is what we do on the show. And I just wonder what made you take that, you know, quite uh, unfortunately, quite radical approach to solutions not to base it in this economic orthodoxy. I think there's in a way economics is another example of um, a, a discipline, if you like, that's in need of, I say in need of modernization. But, you know, to be fair, when you look at into academia, um, you know, the energy and momentum is behind more heterodox approaches, as you as you, you know, reference behavioral economics, huge um, energy, fascinating work being done in the, in the field of behavioral science, in the field of complexity science, um, and um, in the field of, you know, for example, a much more pragmatic economics that is more rooted in, in experiments, which is quite different to the sort of, if you like, the more neoclassical, more theoretical approach that was dominant in, in at least the sort of um, 1990s. And that's, so I do think you know, it's true that the kind of the kind of economics we apply in the kind of heart of public policy hasn't really caught up with that yet. And there's a sort of lag in that we're still, I think, applying as much as we sometimes tell ourselves we're not. We're still, I think, in the main, working from quite orthodox assumptions in the economics we apply in, in most of public policy. Um, not least because a lot of the toolkit that we've developed is tied to those those kind of those assumptions around you know the way in which we do cost benefit analysis in you know, the way in which we calculate net present value of investments etc. Um, so I do think it will take time for if you like public policy to catch up in the economics it applies. But for me actually that I was just going with where the energy is in academia in a, in a more academic economics which is behind these more heterodox approaches and there's there's just incredibly good evidence now that these kinds of approaches can be highly effective and so in it, in a way it's about public policy catching up with where econo economics in the academic world um, has already got to. Well that's really interesting so you were just looking for evidence to base your suggestions and it seemed like heterodox um, uh, uh, economics is where they would be found. You wrote a really fascinating series of articles uh, which which I think 
tell me if I'm wrong, I've tried to summarise, looks to kind of reframe the idea of inequality, and you were saying, let's call it un-inequality, but can you briefly cover why you think it's essential to reframe how we measure, how we see, and I think importantly how we react to inequality? I think there's just another example, inequality, this Inequality is a very um, entrenched concept. It's obviously such a central concept to particularly people in progressive politics or on the left. And I think what's happened with inequality is it's changed before our eyes. And I don't think our conception of inequality has caught up with that. And um, you see this, if you look at the um, data on inequality, I guess the sort of core metrics that we use to understand inequality, I mean, everyone thinks inequality is higher than ever, is rising, um, is, is a central problem. If you look actually at the main measures we use, so, so ratios like the 90-10 ratio of income or earnings, the Gini coefficient, you know, most of these measures of inequality have been flat pretty much for, for 10 or 20 years, um, with some variation around the edges. But you know, what's going on there when we feel that inequality is such a profound problem? I, th I think the answer is inequality isn't isn't rising as we traditionally conceived it, it's changing. And when you dig into some of the more contemporary research around inequality, you see these fascinating changes in, um, for example, the geography of inequality. So um, for example, jobs, good jobs and growth are becoming much more tightly clustered around technology clusters. Hence cities like London, San Francisco have this sort of astronomical wealth and these incredibly highly paid jobs while other regions fall behind. Um, you see a kind of almost an, an experiential um, type of inequality that's emerged where there's, there's this sense that some people are sort of involved in the future and building the future and some people are being left behind in the past. Um, and it seems to me that I guess the kind of thing that inequality is has changed. Um, and I, do, I think our policy response has to change as a result. So you know, to characterise a bit crudely, in the past we felt that let's say in response to 1980s style inequality, what we could do is redistribute. So we could have a tax and benefit system that essentially tax the rich and move some money to people lower down the income distribution. But when you're dealing with inequality as we see it today, where it's this very geographical type of inequality, it's very based around status and esteem and people's place in the future. It seems to me just moving some money around, you know, just taxing London and redistributing, um, isn't enough because it doesn't really speak to this central question of is our equality is our economy working for people and do people feel like they're part of what we're building and do people feel like they're part of it part of opportunity um in a way that gives them self-esteem and feel feel part of the future and you can't just redistribute your way to that you, know, you can't redistribute your, your, your way to that as a problem so um I think we need a, a kind of a response that is much more about how people feel and is much more about the geography of inequality and that really gets deeper into the question of, of how the economy works and doesn't just compensate for the kind of dysfunctions that we're that we're seeing. So it's a big change and I think it's one progressives and people on the left in particular need to need to grapple with. And again, that's that, that's much more of a, a, a changing the rules of the game or a paradigm shift than it is just tweaking um, the, the the numbers and the figures and you know where where little bits of money are going. Well, it was great that you ended with that question because that's how we started. Um, James, thank you so much. I hope that we're a little bit it's a little bit clearer for us the the problems that we've got. Um, but I really like that you are positive. And we're looking ahead and we've identified some of the areas where we can hopefully make a change. And I think we're both agreeing that it's about, maybe you won't use the word radical, but it's about systemic change and it's about making big changes. And we've got to do that over the next couple of decades if we really do want to fix our broken state. James, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.